You're now watching Sports Better's Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network. All right, Jimmy, out along with Paul Stone as we transition from college football to college basketball. And so what we're going to do here uh, on a weekly basis is going to sort of lean on Paul for some of his handicapping approaches and uh, not necessarily picks. And so, Paul, let's get right to it. And the, the thing that we're talking about today is sort of branding. Uh, you know, these the lines are not predictions of, you know, what they're going to, you know, what, what the final score is going to be, although a lot of times it can be that. But it's more based on trying to draw equal action, have the right number, not get lopsided on one side or the other with it. And so some of that is branding, and some of it can be historical. You know, well, the, um, the UCLA's, Kansas, Kentucky's, the Blue Bloods uh, of the world can get a little bit of a bump up, and sometimes a little bump up maybe when it's not even – you know, it's warranted. And then on the other side is sort of these obscure way, who, what, where, uh, these type of teams that are actually pretty good. I guess the best example last year would be Florida Atlantic, which was a, a, a somewhat of an ATM uh, last year against the spread. And so, Paul, we'll start with you uh, with the uh, some of the, the more the lesser known brands and, you know, that teams that you've been backing that have been uh, have been paying uh, this year. Start off uh, in the Southland Conference in Lake Charles, Louisiana, the McNeese State Cowboys. Former LSU VCU coach Will Wade in his first year got the Cowboys up and rolling. Yeah, you know, McNeese State, as you mentioned there in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and the southwestern corner of Louisiana. Not a school that a lot of people think about when they think about basketball tradition. You know, I think other than being the alma mater of uh, Joe Dumars, for those who remember those great uh, Detroit Piston teams of yesteryear, they don't have a particularly rich uh, basketball history, if you will. Hadn't been to the NCAA tournament in over 20 years, uh, their last NCAA tournament appearance way back in 2002. But this is a team that I really like, especially going forward. They've played 15 games so far. They're 13-2. and two. But only 11 of their 15 games have been lined, have actually had lines on them. They are 7-4 and four, mm-hmm. uh, against the spread this far. Thus far Of their four non-covers, they've actually won three of those games outright. Uh, one of the games, they were an underdog at what I think is a really good Louisiana Tech team there in Ruston. They were getting seven points and lost by nine to the Bulldogs. So have been very competitive fairly uh, consistent throughout the year. You know, one of the, the main reasons I really like this McNeese uh, State team going forward is their guard, Shahada Wells. He's a guy who transferred over from TCU, actually began his college career at the junior college level uh, at Tyler Junior College here in East Texas, where I live. Wells averages 19.7 points per game. He's had three of his biggest games, though, on the road. He scored 30 or more points in three road games, two of those being their biggest victories of the uh, the year, double-digit road victories at Michigan and UAB. They lost by two to Western Carolina. But again, in those three games, Wells scored 30 or more points. So he's shown uh, himself to be a big-time player away from his home floor, which I think is really important in college basketball. I McNeese mean, is going to be favored in most of their games uh, from here on out in the Southland Conference. Going to be a double-digit favorite in uh, quite a few of those. But I like McNeese State going forward when they're favored by, say, four points or fewer or in the role of an underdog. Uh, at 13-2, and two, they're certainly going to make a postseason tournament, if not the NCAA tournament, one of the sub-tournaments. They'll likely be the underdog at some point in the postseason. So be patient. But I think McNeese State remains, even though they're an under-the-radar team, that many don't think of when they think about college basketball betting opportunities. I think there'll be some spots to play the Cowboys uh, from this point forward. One, one thing that's consistent with all of these is that McNe- McNeese State went on the road and beat UAB, VCU, and Michigan all by double digits, all by double digits. So so they uh, we've heard of those schools uh, at least, uh, even though uh, Michigan – is only uh, the only power five. They were plus like 460 money line uh, in that Michigan game, and they won it. Uh, they were leading from uh, gate to wire. Um, the 7-4 uh, and four against the spread this year, their NET was 42. They played such a weak opponent in uh, Texas A&M Commerce uh, on Saturday that it dropped to 63. 
Here's the thing to keep in mind with the and because Ken Palm is like Bible for uh, college basketball handicappers and odds makers. They really gravitate to it. The one, all of these examples we're bringing up today, the four examples, are have a disparity between Ken Palm and NET. Maybe the obscure, obscure lack of uh, respect there. It's a little bit of a historical bias in the Ken Palm is what I've learned. So McNeese State, Ken Palm, 88. 63, and they were just 42 uh, a week ago. So a little bit better uh, in the NET. And we know NET is not a, met a perfect metric, but I think it's important. It's definitely a consistency in the examples. The other one is a little school on North Carolina. High point, 12-3-1, and one, one of the most uh, profitable uh, uh, basketball teams uh, against the spread uh, this year. Talking about it there as well. Ken Palm, 122. A little bit more respect to the NET at 104. Yeah, this is a high point team. They've never been to an NCAA tournament, so this would be their their first NCAA tournament appearance. If they were able to, long way to go, but if they were able to emerge as the Big South Conference champion. But you look at this team, you really, in my mind, you couldn't see this coming. I mean, this was a team last year that went fourteen and seventeen overall. They were six and twelve in Big South play. Their coach last year was Gigi Smith for just one season the son of Tubby Smith, who had yeah. been the high, high points coach the previous three years. So they were making a, a coaching transition. They had hired a uh, Creighton assistant, Alan Huss, who had no previous head coaching experience, I don't believe, at this level. So not much. They only had one returning starter, so not much reason to expect the high point Panthers to be so profitable at the betting window. But when you bring in a new coach, you also bring in a lot of new players. In the age of the transfer portal, those players are immediately eligible, and clearly they've had a tremendous uh, roster upgrade. Uh, they play a they play a really nice, exciting brand of basketball. Uh, last they averaged about eighty two points a game. Watch last night's game; they won by five. They were favored by six, so that dropped them to twelve three and one against the spread this year. That game against North Carolina Asheville, but they play free and easy. They've got five players that average in double figures. So really balanced. They don't uh, depend on one person. At some point, you know, you might expect the line maker, the market to catch up to high point. But even though they lost last night against the spread, last night being Wednesday, uh, January 10th, I think there's still going to be some opportunities. I'm going to continue to ride the hot hand. And like you mentioned, high points, not a team that's going to get a whole lot of respect from the ranking metrics and from the, the bookmakers and from the betters and so forth. So I think there remains – uh, some value on this under the radar high point team uh, there, 17 miles southwest of uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, in High Point, North Carolina. Paul, do you think you can find a few more flaws in sort of these low volume games that you know a lot of people, you know, casual betters don't want to bet games that they can't watch. You know, a lot of these smaller conferences, and so you know because and, and there's limits on some of the smaller conferences as well that you can find a little bit more of. Um, of, of value uh, in, in some of these lines and some of the more high uh, high profile matchups. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, you've got you know sm when there's small smaller volume, there's a smaller market. The book has less exposure, so you're not going to spend a, a great deal of your manpower uh, and your work effort uh, towards games and teams where there's less exposure. You're going to focus on those games where there's a lot of money coming in. Uh, a lot of exposure and the book needs to, to get things squared away, you know, and uh, not get hit hard on one or two games. And the volume's just not going to be there in a high point game. So I certainly think these smaller leagues, these under so-called under the radar teams offer um, more opportunity for the uh, astute, hardworking better. It is difficult to uh, sometimes get information uh, from these schools, you don't have as many uh, media markets covering them, not as many, you know, X or Twitter, Twitter uh, follows out there that can give you information. But you can just eyeball the results and kind of see that uh, a team maybe is playing above their expectation or below their expectation and uh, either getting the money or losing the money each week and just ride the hot hand, so to speak, until it runs out. All right, uh, Paul, I got a couple of examples on the flip side. You know, some blue bloods or some real strong brands that are not performing up to their usual level. And that's where I look for a lot of these early in the year and try to find, 
you know, the most high-profile brands. And, well, you can't get much more high-profile than UCLA. It's been, it's been a little bit, but, I mean, Cronin's gone over there and done a really nice job. Of course, the classic game in the Final Four against Gonzaga where Suggs hits the half-court shot. Uh, but they, they just kind of missed on a sort of roster building. We can't say recruiting cycle anymore. We'll just have to say, you know, with the transfer portal, with the with the signees, just a, a roster building. I mean, it is a dip off. They're up. They're five nine and one against the spread. They're Ken Palm one oh seven. UCLA. If they're if they're not one of the top one hundred teams, that's really bad. But they're NET. They're not as good as one oh seven. Their NET is one seventy six. So I mean, we're talking about a big disparity there. Tonight they've got, uh, or Thursday night they've got uh, they got to go to Salt Lake City, which is always a tough assignment. This could be really, really ugly uh, for UCLA against Utah. I mean, uh, the, anything you want to talk about uh, as far as the Bruins in this particular unit for it just looks seems like an off year for for Cronin's crew. Yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to to fall in college basketball, even if you're a power like UCLA in some cases. Made the Sweet 16 last year, just three years removed from a Final Four appearance, and they were actually ranked, not that we put a whole lot of stock in this as betters, but they were ranked in the coaches poll, preseason poll at number 25. Uh, but like you said, they're 5-9-1 and one against the spread, seven freshmen on the roster, so you could kind of see it coming. Uh, they've lost seven of their last eight games. Uh, four of those losses, they were actually favored, and they were favored by four points or more. And like you mentioned, it doesn't get a whole lot easier. They play at Utah uh, tonight on Thursday, January 11th. Going to be, uh, I think right now they're an eight-and-a-half-point underdog. And then they host Washington this coming Sunday, January 14th. That game's going to be right around Pickham. They might be a small dog. But, uh, man, it's tough to see uh, better days ahead for the Bruins. Yeah, the uh, Another one that I like to try and look at is Indiana, but they've tightened up a little bit. Only a six-point uh, differential between Ken Palm and NET. They're still under five hundred this year. Uh, in the, uh, I did jump on them when Nebraska had them, and we know about Hoiberg. Uh, secrets out on them uh, for this crew after they beat uh, Utah by double digits uh, this week. But speaking of the Sweet 16, back-to-back, not nearly the historical branding that UCLA, but a powerful, resource-rich SEC program. But also since this coach has been at Arkansas and Musselman, they've had a lot of success. And he's had roster building. He's very good in the transfer portal, uh, in roster building, and back-to-back Sweet 16s. This Arkansas team, he missed uh, this year. They uh, they are having a rough, rough go of it. Got uh, drilled again this week in Athens uh, at Georgia. They are 4-11 and against the spread. Their Ken Palm is 80. Their NET is 109, so a 29-point differential uh, right there. They go to the Swamp this week I'm a, uh, and, and take on Florida on Saturday. I think that could be a really tough go. Arkansas, what, what happened with uh, with Co- the must bus in his roster build this past year? Because that's another one. It's not up to its usual standards that it's been lately. Yeah, I mean, you look at Arkansas, they had three players taken in this past uh, summer's NBA draft in the uh, first two, this two-round draft, but in the first 38 picks. So they had Anthony Black went sixth overall, uh, Nick Smith Jr. went 27th overall, and then in the second round, uh, Jordan Walsh goes 38th overall. So three players taken in the first 38 picks of the draft just hadn't been able to play, replace that uh, productivity you know, they fell, first of all, in their season, their conference opener, rather, at home. Last Saturday, uh, they lose to Auburn at home by 32 points. And then last night, Wednesday, January 10th, they go to Georgia, lose by 10 points to the uh, to the Bulldogs. As you said, they travel to Florida this Saturday, January 16th, going to be about a seven or eight point uh, underdog in that game. And they just don't have that top shelf talent. And I think the thing, same rings true with UCLA. You know, if they just had one player uh, who was a uh, go-to guy that they could count on, uh, that would give them at least some uh, ability to win some games and be at that level. But neither right now seem to have those type of uh, people. And Eric Musselman, for all the uh, success that he's had at both the college and NBA level, this is just not one of uh, his better additions. And much like UCLA, if Arkansas doesn't just flip a switch and start winning some basketball games, 
uh, they're not even going to be in the NCAA tournament this year. No, I don't, the, 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 those teams, I'll be very, very surprised uh, if they are uh, in the NCAA tournament. Speaking of the SEC, 6-1 ATS home teams uh, in the midweek games this week. The only one, LSU was minus 8.5. It closed at 8.5. It fell 8 against Vanderbilt. So all of the other home teams won. So that's another one where Arkansas is going down to Gainesville and play. Each and every week, uh, it's our uh, sort of uh, college basketball handicapping approach, and we uh, uh, point some, you know, cite some games that are uh, either just in the rearview mirror or on the horizon, and uh, we'll be doing that with Paul each and every week all the way through the March Madness. All right, I'm for, G- uh, for Paul Stone, I'm Jimmy Ott here on the Sports Betters Paradise on the Bet Rivers Network.